All right, we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, Brandon, you can let folks in as they trickle in. Welcome everybody to our September Learning Our Landscape presentation. Uh, I'm David Brownell from the North Olympic History Center here, uh, as always in partnership with the Jamestown Squalum Tribe. To begin with, we wanna acknowledge that the North Olympic History Center does our work on the first lands of this, the first peoples of this area the Klalem, Macaw, Quileute, and Ho River tribes. We recognize the rich and important history of the tribal nations in Klalem County and commit our work to this tribal land acknowledgement to work together collectively to help preserve and share their history. Uh, as always, this presentation is gonna be recorded and will be posted online on the Jamestown Tribal Library's YouTube page at youtube.com slash JST library. Um, and today we're going to be talking about the sluicing of the hogback, which is a pretty massive public works project that uh, went on in 1914, uh, also known as the Port Angeles Regrade Project, that literally uh, reshaped the, the size and um, extent of downtown Port Angeles. <clears throat> and I'm working without a computer mouse today, so bear with me if it takes a second to figure out how to click through. <laughs> Um, so to begin with, uh, uh, most of the photos, not all, but most of the photos that I'm going to be going through today um, are from a photo album that was actually donated at, to the History Center in 2021 by John Warder, uh, who was formerly the city engineer for the city of Port Angeles. Um, he received the photo album. It was uh, put together by W. Chester Morse of Lewis Wiley and Morse Hydraulic Contractors, who are based in Seattle around the turn of the century. Uh, all of the photos in the album were taken by Curtis and Miller Phot Photographic Studio uh, between 1911 and 1920. The vast majority of uh, the, they operated between those years. Um, this project occurred between roughly uh, June and August of 1914. Uh, the album itself contains 112 black and white photos that document the project. Um, each photograph has handwritten detailed annotation in the bottom left corner. Uh, you'll be able to see most of those, but I've added in um, notes on each of these to kind of give you an idea of where we're at uh, as we move around town. And they're sort of roughly chronological and they sort of show you uh, what downtown looked like before the project, you know, what steps were taken during the project, and then uh, finishes off with, with the actual covering of the streets with wooden planks. Um, if you're interested in looking more of these photos, I've got about 25 to 30 of them in this presentation. If you're interested in looking in the entire album, you can just get on our online catalog site, uh, www.nohc.catalogaccess.com. And if you search for this accession number in the bottom right corner of your screen, 2021.11, that'll actually pull up the entire album of photos. You can click through, uh, and each photo has associated metadata of what uh, buildings are visible, um, when the photo is taken, et cetera. So to start with, why did they sluice the hogback? Um, this is uh, one of the most detailed early maps that I could find of Port Angeles. This is the 1892 uh, USCGS topographical and uh, hydrographic map of Port Angeles Harbor. And if we zoom in, you can actually see the hogback. So hogback is a term um, that's used throughout this country, um, applied to ridges and hills that are visually similar to the shape of, of a hog or a wild boar. Um, so for those of you who aren't very familiar with wild boars, like I grew up in the South, um, wild hogs, boars have a much higher shoulder than they have rump. So you can kind of think of a, a hog back hill as a hill that rises up to a certain elevation and then the ridge sort of drops down and tapers off um, in the other direction. And so uh, with respects to this hogback hill, the highest point was actually the ridge that extended out uh, between Laurel and Lincoln streets uh, and then between First and Front streets in downtown Port Angeles. And you can see the actual original alignment of Peabody Creek actually came uh, it started to the east of Lincoln Street. It crossed uh, where you currently have the intersection of Lincoln and First, and then it actually shot west and then north into the harbor, um, entering the harbor between Oak and Laurel Street. 
Uh, and so a big part of this project was actually rerouting that creek under where Lincoln Street is today, uh, literally getting the hog back, that ridge, out of the way of downtown development and using all of the fill that came from that ridge to extend the streets, to raise the street level uh, 10 to 14 feet in some places, uh, and then extend it out into the inner tidal zone. Um, this wasn't unique. I'll go back just a second. Um, this wasn't unique to just Port Angeles. Uh, similar projects occurred in Seattle, uh, as well as Port Townsend and other coastal cities around this region. Essentially, what happened was the first wave of settlement um, on these deep water harbors that uh, the, the white immigrants knew was good for uh, future economic development. They found these deep water harbors that were great for ships, but unfortunately just had a small shingle beach. And that was where the original um, small town sort of built up on the shingle beach. And then they rapidly ran out of room. And so they essentially had a choice. They could start building up on top of the bluff. Uh, but what would happen if you did that is you would essentially cut off the businesses, um, businesses and homes that were up on top of the bluff from access to the piers, the docks, um, and thus the ships. And that was the primary way that um, trade goods were brought in and out of this region was uh, via the ocean. So um, it made more economic sense, even though it, it involved a, a huge undertaking in terms of, of time, energy, and manpower. Uh, it made more sense to actually extend the waterfront out into the inner tidal zone using the fill from the hillside behind um, and actually building out a, a broader, um, basically downtown building envelope for Port Angeles to be built on. Uh, at that time, and you'll see in a lot of these photos, there were quite a few businesses that were essentially sitting on, um, on pilings uh, that were reached using uh, piers and docks from the city um, but weren't actually didn't actually have solid foundations based on the ground or in bedrock. Um, similarly, when you read early accounts of Port Angeles, uh, one of the biggest complaints was what was called the curse of Port Angeles, which was the smell uh, when the tide came in, because essentially the tide was the uh, sanitary system that would flush all of the sewage out from underneath the buildings, essentially all of the toilets, um, and everything else emptied through holes in the floor right onto the beach. Uh, and so you can imagine as the population expanded and you had a couple thousand people uh, living in downtown Port Angeles, um, that situation started to get real stinky on low tides, um, was unpleasant uh, and just unsanitary. Um, this photo is sort of looking east. This would be... Um, from Laurel, where Laurel, it, actually, this would be actually, if you're currently at uh, Laurel and Railroad Avenue, so this is also now on dry land um, looking to the east, you can see this whole area has now been entirely uh, filled in and is now dry land. This kind of gives you a little bit of a glimpse of what Port Angeles was like uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, lots and lots and lots of mud. Um, it was extremely hard to get your cart in and out of town on, on rainy days. You can see um, the actual hogback, part of the hogback hill there to the east of town. Um, and then you can also see a really steep bluff just behind those buildings, which uh, the stairwell, which is kind of center right uh, in, this, in this image, that's actually the same place where uh, the stairs come down in downtown Port Angeles and there's a little plaza with the mural today. Um, then this is this is moving one street over. So uh, in downtown Port Angeles, you have Railroad Avenue, which is sort of the farthest north, uh, farthest north street, which was where the the old railroad line um, trestle used to be. Then you've got Front Street, it's the second street coming south, and then you've got First Street. Uh, is, is the third street as you come south from Railroad Avenue and, and first street's the last street before you head up the bluff. Once you go south up to the top of the bluff, then you have second street continuing on. So um, really the extent of this project was three city blocks, not even, it was two city blocks north to south and about four city blocks east to west. So these are the two best pictures that I could find of the hogback itself. 
Um, the picture on the left is looking south on Lincoln from front. So uh, if you think of yourself as sitting um, kind of at the intersection, um, well, the intersection of front Lincoln today where uh, there was a, a building that was just demolished just to the south, southeast of that intersection where you can see the new mural on the wall, that would have been just to the left of this photo. Um, and this pipeline is literally running under Lincoln Street today. So you can actually get a sense of the the amount of dirt that was removed from this ridge was was 40, 50 feet tall by about 100 feet wide and an absolutely immense amount of fill um, that was sluiced off the hillside. The picture on the right is looking from um, basically if you were uh, standing at the intersection of uh, Lincoln and First today, the Elks building would be right there in the, the left side of the photo. Um, then the city parking lot would be on the right side. And actually, if you're on Lincoln looking south today, you can still see part of the Hogback Hill there uh, in the corner of that city parking lot. You can see where that hillside is cut straight up and down. It doesn't have a natural slope at all. And that's as far as the sluicing guns got in terms of of, of wiping the sediment off the side of that hill. And that's why you have that straight up and down face where there's almost no vegetation today. So uh, to begin, the first step of the project was actually digging out the, the footings for the coffer dams that had to go on each side of the street. So uh, they dug these trenches and then they poured cement and they actually built, uh, uh, built walls and then filled up cement going up these walls five, six, sometimes eight feet above um, the original ground level. And those cement walls ended up, those were A, to hold all of the sluiced fill material, but primarily to protect the businesses um, behind the wall. Uh, you know, a lot of these businesses stayed open during this project. And there's a couple pictures in the album. And then there's actually a whole nother series of, of photographs that are not in this photo album, but are available in the Burt Kellogg collection at the North Olympic Library Systems that show um, flood events where the sluiced material actually topped over the coffer dams and washed into the ground story of these businesses, um, but essentially built that wall up about eight to 10 feet. And the first story of all of these businesses that you see on the left side of this picture um, were either buried or the building itself was raised um, to account for the, the new street level. Likewise, I showed you the map earlier, the original alignment of Peabody Creek. Um, one of the other big parts of this project was rerouting Peabody Creek um, more to the east. So uh, basically they they dug through, uh, you can see the bridge here is actually where um, Lincoln Street originally crossed over on a bridge over the creek. So uh, once they tunneled through the hogback, they put in that pipeline that we looked at uh, four slides ago, routed the creek under the ridge, and then um, they actually backfilled a, a lot of the Peabody Creek Valley. So um, if you're on Lincoln Street looking to the north um, and you're standing in front of the, the Carnegie Library building where the Lower Elwha Column have their museum today, um, there's a small parking lot on the east side of the road. That parking lot is entirely on fill from this project that backfilled over the portion of this ravine that we're actually looking at in these photos. So most of what you're looking at here has actually been buried under eight to 14 feet of fill. Um, and there's a parking lot on top of it. Uh, in this photo, you can actually see that coffer dam um, and the bulwarks being coming coming down the actual hillside. You can see as it goes up the hillside, the wall was actually much taller, 10 to 15 feet, um, to account for the the actual um, the, the energy of the water as those sluicing guns um, blasted into the hillside. They didn't want the stuff flowing over in each direction. Um, and then essentially building these channels uh, along the main thoroughfares east to west. And then what we'll see in, in the coming slides is then they built other wooden bulwarks and coffer dams um, that went into the side streets, Laurel, Oak, um, and then essentially partitioned off sections of those roads to be filled in as the material came downhill. 
Um, so again, we, we looked at a smaller version of this photo, but you can see they actually tunneled through the hogback itself, put the pipeline in, and you can see there's actually water flowing through this pipe. So they rerouted the creek before the project even started. Um, absolutely massive undertaking. So this is that current view today. Uh, you can see how totally different. If you look in the top left corner of this uh, photo, you can see the leaves of a big leaf maple that's actually still on um, the remnant toe of that hogback. But uh, basically from behind the Matthews Glass Building um, to the east, the, the entire rest of that ridge is gone. Um, so this is if you turned around from that last photo and looked to the north, um, you know, today, if you're standing on Lincoln, this would be looking directly north towards the city wharf. Um, the Faro Marine Life Center and City Pier would be um, ahead and to the right where that, that single structure is. Uh, and so you can see this was all built out on piers. This is all now uh, solid ground. And that was actually a separate later project that extended all the way out to Railroad Avenue. Um, Railroad Avenue was not um, built up during this project. This just went out to, uh, extended out to Front Street. Yep. So again, um, turning around and looking west on Front Street from the east line of Lincoln, Lincoln, you can see on the right side of this image that those concrete bulwarks are completed. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you in a couple images, there's a place where the, I'll put in a, a plug for the um, Port Angeles Underground Tours which are done through the uh, Port Angeles Chamber of Commerce. If you go down to the Visitor Center, um, you can find brochures and a sign-up sheet. Uh, there's a uh, certain building where they still go to the, uh, the underground story that was buried under this project. And when you go down there and you look, you can see um, this same cement bulwark that held in all of the sluice materials. Um, also very cool, up in the upper left, you can see a steam-powered uh, steam-powered bulldozer essentially that ran on rails um, on the the wooden platforms up at the top so this is looking uh that same view today so again where these buildings got buried um under the dirt to the right that's now where the gateway transit center is today and you'll note the gateway transit center is offset at a lower level um, Likewise, there's quite a few places in Port Angeles where um, there's parking lots behind Country Air Market um, and other building lots between buildings where it goes down to almost the original ground level. There's still some fill there that was that was to bring it up above the tide line. Um, but you'll notice that those parking lots are six to eight feet below street level. Um, they're much closer to the original um, the original elevation of downtown Port Angeles. So uh, you can see here, they've got the concrete uh, coffer dams on each side of the street. They're starting to uh, uh, put in the sectional um, cross dams. So essentially what they did once they had these cement walls up on each side of the main thoroughfares, Front and First Street, they were going to be used to channel the sluice material off of the, the hogback. Then the side channels going down Laurel and Oak and the cross streets were done in sections. And they were staggered uh, according to elevation so that you can essentially think of it as, as, as boxes coming down the hillside. Each box is at a lower elevation. And as the sluice material came down and would fill up one coffer dam, the heavier material settles to the bottom, the lighter material in water comes up to the top, flows out over the top into the next coffer dam. And so essentially what they were doing was sluicing the material into these coffer dams that were in steps and then letting that dry out. And so what you'd essentially have is stepped fill material that then could be leveled into a grade that's now the the graded road that you drive up and down as you're coming up and down the hillside on First and Front Street. Um, and so again, this is them starting to build out. Um, this is on uh, looking west on Front and Oak. So uh, just to the right of this picture where that the building is visible, that's where the uh, Field Hall Arts and Events Center is today. And so this shows you about the, the westward extent of the project went on Oak Street, just to in front of where Field Hall is today. So 
Um, this wasn't all of downtown, but again, it went um, north to uh, north to fill in under Front Street, then west to fill under Oak Street, uh, and then east to, to just east of Lincoln Street. Kind of gives you the core. And I've got a map at the end of this presentation that kind of shows you that extent. Uh, the sluicing guns themselves, which you can see one of them on the left side of this photo, were actually brought down from the gold mines in Alaska. Um, so that was one of the ways that gold mining was done in Alaska was they would literally just blast the hillside away and then they would screen through all of the material that was being sluiced looking for um, gold nuggets and gold dust. Once the gold rush was over, this was a great use for those uh, water cannons and they pumped seawater up out of the harbor. Um, into the sluice cannons and then just started blasting away on the hillside. So uh, this is at uh, Front Street and Chase looking west. Uh, so the, the Red Lion Hotel is actually um, just behind where you see that tree line here. Um, and then below this is uh, what's now called Hollywood Beach in that area, which also has a lot of fill built up. Um, you can see there's a water line on the far left that's pumping water up to the water cannon, water cannons blasting the hillside. And then just to the north of the water cannon pipeline, just to the right of that pipeline, you can see a channel that's actually, there's, there's a series of little bulwarks or walls built that are funneling material into a channel with an open top that then goes into a pipeline. That's the sluice material that's then flowing downhill um, into those coffer dams. And you'll also notice the way that they were doing this left behind these massive piles of cobbles. So essentially, as they sluice the hillside, all of the finer sediments, silts, um, lighter dirt materials, gravels got washed down into that pipeline and down into those coffer dams, but all the larger cobbles and rocks got left behind um, to get removed by hand or sort of pushed into areas where they could be used to, to fill out gaps in the road, roadbed. Uh, so again, these are more shots of that conduit. Uh, you can see that the conduit itself was actually, um, these old wooden pipes were built the same way that uh, barrels are done today with staves that are wrapped around um, with iron hooping, holding those together and then fitted in sections. Um, there's probably a few of those still left somewhere underground. Uh, and then you can see to the far right are smaller metal pipes. Those are the uh, water lines that were also installed during this project. So not only did they use this project as an opportunity to raise the street levels, but to address the um, sanitary issues that I brought up earlier, uh, they also buried sanitary sewer and water lines under the streets. Um, they actually built a sewer outfall that was out in Port Angeles Harbor, then connected all of the building sewer lines to that so that essentially all of the sewage flowed out, out into Port Angeles Harbor and didn't pop up right underneath the city, um, creating that smelly situation. And, and in the image in the lower left here, you can see the scaffolding that that sluice material is being piped on, that indicates the future road level. So you can start to get a sense of the scale of um, how much fill is brought in and how high that was hiked up over the original ground level. So this is looking north on Laurel from First Street. And again, you can see those staggered coffer dams. They're starting to fill up. Uh, with liquid material, you can see the reflective water. That's the sluice material. And like I mentioned earlier, as that came down the hill, was funneled down the hillside in those pipelines and pumped into these coffer dams, the heavier material settles down first. The lighter material would flow through. Um, they would essentially make a small trough that the, the extra lighter material would flow through into the next one, settle again and creating a series of staggered steps until eventually um, what was left over just flowed out into the bay. Uh, this is a really cool photo. You can see this guy is actually standing on a bridge that's connecting the Morse block building over to the south side of the street. So these buildings, most of these businesses stayed open and they had to be accessed. Um, and the only way to do that was essentially to build bridges over. 
Um, and so there's actually multiples of these that were built and then they started to get moved. I think they, they disassembled and then reassembled essentially the same bridges in different places to allow access. Um, you can see behind the guy in the, in the far distance, there's another bridge about a, a city block over. <clears throat> and those had to stay in place for at least two months as that material dried out underneath them. Um, you know, it was essentially quicksand. So you definitely didn't walk, want to walk in that. Uh, but over time, as it dried out, settled into almost cement. It was it was so dense. This is this is a photo that's uh, actually from the Burt Kellogg collection at Knowles. This isn't from the the Morse album, um, but this is showing you essentially how that water was released into the harbor. So as it came in here, and eventually. They would, they would stop this flow, and then once they blocked off um, this uh, where this flow is exiting, then that directed the rest of the sluice material to keep going farther west and start filling in Oak Street. So this is Laurel, um, and they worked from east to west across the city. Um, so this is this is looking back at the massive bulwark that was constructed uh, along Hollywood Beach. So this photo is essentially looking at where the, the large photo on the right side of your screen is where the Red Lion Hotel, its parking lot are today. So again, both of those are sitting on feet of fill. And then what looks like a tree line, a natural tree line in a hillside behind the hotel was actually this uh, 20 to 30 foot uh, constructed bulwark to hold the fill material as it came down off the hogback. Um, and again, where railroad, where railroad Avenue got its name was, it was originally the railroad trestle. So um, this photo is looking east on Railroad Avenue from Lincoln. Uh, if you were standing there today, you would be looking into the parking lot for the Farrell Marine Life Center in the city, uh, the city pier. So again, all of this is on fill. Uh, you can see actually a couple canoes um, and shacks over in the right side of your screen. Uh, this area was still used by the Lower Elwha Column as a campsite in the early 1900s. This is before the establishment of the Lower Elwha Reservation. Uh, and Hollywood Beach was a was a pretty popular camping site for the Klallam, um throughout this period. Uh, and so you can see there, there are portions of Hollywood Beach that would have been that original beach, um, but the Discovery Trail runs on what was originally the railroad trestle. So that kind of gives you a, a sense of um, the scale of how much fill has been brought in and how far that beach has extended out into what's now Port Angeles Harbor. So this is a really cool photo. Uh, this is looking west from Laurel to Oak Street. Uh, when we first started going through this photo album, we were trying to figure out what this brick kiln was. And then we realized uh, that metal cylinder that you see on top is actually a manhole cover. These kiln structures were actually brick chimneys that were built to connect the manhole and the access to the sanitary sewers that they were putting in under the under the fill, under the streets. Um, so if you look on the right side of this photo, there's a there's a platform there and a balcony that's on the second floor of that building. Um, take a good look at those windows and that balcony because we're going to look at it on the next slide. Um, but again, if you look in the bottom left corner of this image, you'll see more of the smaller metal pipes. Those are the future um, water lines that were also being put in and connecting all the buildings. So the orange arrow is pointing out the manhole. There it is. So if you walk uh, on um, Oak Street, I'm sorry, if you're looking, if you're walking on Laurel, looking west towards Oak, that's the manhole cover you're looking at. Those are the same railings there on the right side and the same three windows. Um, and I, I put a plug in for the Port Angeles Underground Tour. If you go on the Port Angeles Underground Tour, this building on the right side um, that we're talking about is actually the, the building that that, uh, that tour takes you to the buried first story. Um, still has the original building fronts with the large um, single pane windows. Uh, what they ended up doing was once that first story, the businesses got buried, uh, and that was that actually happened on a couple different city blocks. 
quite a few of those first story uh, building entrances that actually survived almost a century were uh, were buried about 30, 40 years ago um, by a, a later public's work project that was filling them back in um, for public safety purposes. But they did leave a few places where that original uh, that original first story that was the, the Port Angeles original elevation is still left behind. And what the business owners did was they painted over the windows so that they weren't staring out uh, at a dirt wall. Um, but it's still, it's a really, really cool place to visit. And I highly recommend checking it out on one of the underground tours. So this is looking east on front from Peabody and you're starting to see um, that sluice material as they're working their way into the hillside, they followed the alignments of Front and First Street. And so that's how uh, when you're driving downtown Port Angeles today, oh, I thought I had another photo there. Um, the road grade is separate from the grade that all of the homes that were built earlier than the 19 earlier than 1914 are sitting up above the roadway. Um, and they graded that so that it was a it was a much shallower slope as you drove in and out of town to the east. Uh, so here's a great photo showing you as they started to bring that level up. If you look on the right side there, you can see the businesses starting to get buried by the street level. You can also see their very simplified way of leveling that out. They would drag, and you can see actually the the uh, um, planks laying on the ground. So they would level it out. Then they would lay uh, planks running the length of the roadway. And then they would lay pr planks crosswise to that. And they actually, um, they didn't pave the roads. They actually planked the roads um, with massive, um, what I'm guessing were probably old growth. Uh, in the photos, they look to be something like four by 10 or six by 10 inch um, massive timbers. So looking south on Oak from front, uh, this is kind of caddy corner to field hall today. Uh, and you can see that uh, if you got one block over, all of those businesses were on the beach uh, where the photographer was standing taking this photo was about 10 feet above the inner tidal zone. So if you look at that today, you're looking at uh, the old, uh, I believe it's the old police station building. And then behind that is the uh, North Olympic Healthcare Building's parking lot. Again, all built up on about 10 feet of fill. Looks completely different than it did 100 years ago. So likewise, this is, uh, we looked at this, uh, this area before they started. So this is once they've actually um, filled in the extent of the project as far as west as they were going on Oak. Uh, so again, where the Gutenberg, Brothers building is is where Field Hall is today, um, and this is where the where the road stopped, and then it was all Port Angeles Harbor west from there. So again, all of that was built out. Um, I want to say later in the, the between the 1930s and 1960s was um, when the rest of that section between um, uh, the terminus of Oak Street in this image and where the uh, Port Angeles uh, City Marina is today. So this is what that looks like today. Again, completely different. Um, Phil goes out about another block to the west and then you know farther if you look uh, to the south. So going back to the east side of town, I love this picture because the sluice gun's staring right at the photographer. Uh, this is looking west on front from 150 feet east of Vine. Uh, and you can see that they actually took out even, even on the... Uh, uphill portion of this project, they were they were still removing a significant amount of fill in this place, probably 10 to 12 feet is what that looks like today. So this is going back one block over. This is showing you those staggered bulwarks that I was telling you about and the step system that they used um, to essentially create, to, to fill in a more gradual slope for the road. Um, so each of these steps, you know, is, is only, what, six inches to a foot off. Um, and then you can level that off relatively easily, pave that, and you get a nice smooth road. And this is what that looks like today. 
the south side of Front Street between Peabody and Chase. Um, I wanted to show this because if you drive, if you pay attention to the south side of the road as you're driving past this, you'll actually see places where um, this hillside has actually been um, essentially covered over with a sheet of cement to stop the erosion. And you can see that starting to happen in this photo um, between the, the two guys that are standing in the left, um, the left side of this, the historic image below the, the house at the top of the bluff, you can see more material sloughing off of that bluff behind them. You know, erosion controls um, weren't a big part of the planning back 100 years ago. They didn't have the SEPA review process uh, to go through and they didn't have to get permits. So um, there's a much... Uh, sort of wild west way of doing things which is essentially peel off that hillside and then what they realized was um, especially the first winter after this project when you got a heavy rain all of that exposed dirt just starts to slough off and run down the roadway uh, and so what they did was they covered a lot of that hillside with just a sheet of three to six inches of cement that they poured over the entire hillside um, if you drive past now you can you can actually see that and there's places where it's starting to break up but um, looks very weird. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, instead of paving the roads, they actually packed it down and then covered it with wooden planks. Uh, they waited three more years to actually pave the streets. And I believe that was probably to let that drying process finish off before um, they permanently paved it. And this is showing you uh, basically the, the changed downtown footprint. So this is a map from the 1920s, and you can see uh, the extent of, you know, Front Street going west to just west of the intersection with Oak Street. You can see that line. That's where this project ended. Likewise, Laurel going north just past Front Street. That's where it ended. And then Railroad Avenue was still out on trestles at that time um, up on a pier above the water. Um, a lot of these are still the same businesses. Like I mentioned earlier, those that um, some of them had the first floor of the business buried, <clears throat> quite a few other ones, especially the smaller structures, they were able to actually um, just jack them up, lift them, and then backfill under and then settle it back down. So I'm going to wrap it up there. I will say if if there's folks who are interested in, in learning more, uh, checking this out in first person, we are going to be doing a tour on October 7th. Uh, tickets are $35 and you can find them on Eventbrite. You can scan this QR code or find links on our website or Facebook page. Um, relatively small group. We're going in a, a van of 10 people and I believe half the tickets are already sold. So um, if you're interested, make sure you get your tickets as soon as possible. And I will leave uh, my work cited up here for a second. Um, like I mentioned earlier, this presentation will be recorded. So uh, if you want to check these out, you can always check out the recorded presentation and, and see these work cited however long you want. Um, and so I will stop there and pause for questions.